through things, and I think it'll be a, a blessing for you. Um, we're going to be talking about our annual budget. Uh, we also have a proposal coming from the media committee about our AV system upgrade. So again, want to invite you to, to come to that. We have a softball game this Friday at Lynn Park, 615. And I know Britton and company would love to see you out there. Uh, our team is 50-50. So we're just, uh, just right now blessing the other teams by giving them some free wins. But it's been, it's been a lot of fun. So I want to invite you to come to that Friday, 615. Also, our, our traditional midweek services are ongoing. So Wednesday night here at the church at 630, we add to you. And then we also have uh, our youth uh, group that meets every Wednesday night at 6.30 as well here at the church. So I want to invite you to come to that. We have a youth lock-in coming up on the 29th, I believe, 29th of July. And I've been told that there is an important and very competitive hockey game that goes on at this lock-in. And I, I've uh, signed up for this competitive hockey game. And so I've, I've, uh, I'm committing to you, those of you who who are, are disappointed that I don't wear a tie every Sunday. If I, if I lose, if my team loses, I will wear a tie the next Sunday, okay? So there's some, some motivation for the youth to try and take me down. Uh, a couple of prayer requests uh, just to bring to your attention. Dan Hadlock, who's been attending for the last couple of months, and his wife, um, Dan has had recently a week, I believe it was Friday, he was out of town, and he had some faint feelings, and he, va- he eventually fainted. And they took him to the hospital, to the ER, and found something wrong with his heart. And so he had a stent put in, I believe, yesterday. He's still in the hospital today. So be lifting up Dan and, and his wife, Jeannie Budtail. And so I want to just ask you to lift her up as well. I think that's all the announcements I have. I miss anything? Okay, well, at this time, I want to invite you to go to the Lord in prayer while the music plays as we prepare our hearts for worship and reflect on our great God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is such a blessing and a privilege to come before you today as a body of believers united in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we confess that throughout the week we are so distracted oftentimes by the the many things that tug at our hearts, but Lord, you are our hope. The Bible says, whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So, Lord, that, let that be the call of our heart this morning. And as we open your word, we study, we ask that you would speak to our hearts. And let us fall more in love with you today for the glory of Christ. In your name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. This time I want to invite uh, the new members to come forward. There's a time in your program here. We've been having a number of um, new members go through our new members class, and they want to join our church. I've been meeting with them and just excited to commend them to you. So will uh, Bob and Cindy Glasgow, will you come forward? Will the Perezes, will you come forward, please? Um, we also have Bill, Bill Payne would like to join our church. You can just line up here, it's fine, or wherever you'd like to stand. Um, Bill Payne would also like to join our church, join our church fellowship. We're excited for each one of these to, to be welcomed into our body. I, I've had the privilege of speaking with each one here over the last few weeks and just getting to know them better 
and to hear their testimony about how God is working in their hearts and has worked in their lives. And so it's just been so encouraging getting to know them. And uh, so I'll go through Pastor Bob here and Cindy. Uh, They're my in-laws, if you didn't know that already. And so I'm excited for them to be joining. I don't know why you would want to join this church. I'm kidding. Of course I know why, but I'm glad that I haven't scared you away. Uh, We're so, again, just delighted for you to to join. This church actually, for those of you who didn't know, um, has ordained Pastor Bob as a Baptist pastor. This was probably seven or eight years ago. And so he's an ordained minister. And uh, again, just excited to have them. And the Perez family, you know them. You've been blessed by them already through their, their just faithful service and leading us in worship and song. And so we're just, again, just delighted to be welcoming them. I'm going to try and get the names right here. With Willie and Julie and Joey and Willie Jr. and Susie and Sophie and Nancy. I think I got that right. All right. Yeah. If that deserves a clap, then I, I, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Okay. But again, I just, again, we're so thankful for you, and I just had a, a wonderful discussion with you yesterday. And if you don't, have a, don't know their background and know their testimony, please take a minute to, to talk to Willie and Julie. They just have a, a wonderful testimony in their family of how they came to know Christ. And um, so at this time, I just want to invite you, all those in favor of welcoming these members into our church body, say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no or nay, and I know there are none. Um, Just as a quick comment, um, Sophie and Bill Payne, who is not here today, are joining our church um, contingent on their baptism. And so they haven't been baptized yet, so contingent on their baptism, then they will become official members. All the others here are members now. At this point, I want to invite all of you to stand as we're going to say our church covenant together. This is just a special opportunity we have to affirm our covenant, and it should be on the wall for us to read. I have not memorized it, and I hope that you have not either, Um, (laughs) but we should be reading these. So I just want to go through this again, just an opportunity for you to reaffirm the covenant that we're making together and with the Lord. So let's read this responsibly together. Having, as we trust, been brought by divine grace to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to give up ourselves to him and having been baptized upon our profession of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we do now rely on his gracious aid solemnly and joyfully affirm our covenant with each other. We will work and pray for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We will walk together in the brotherly love as becomes the members of a Christian church, exercise an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, and faithfully admonish and entreat one another as occasion may require. We will not forsake the assembly of ourselves together nor neglect to pray for ourselves and others. We will endeavor to bring up such as many at any time may be under our care in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and by a pure and loving example to seek the salvation of our family and friends. We will rejoice at each other's happiness and endeavor with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows. We will seek, by divine aid, to live carefully in the world, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, and remembering that, as we have been voluntarily buried by baptism and raised again from the symbolic grave, so there is on us a special obligation now to lead a new and holy life. We will work together for the continuance of a faithful evangelical ministry in this church as we sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, the spread of the gospel through all nations. We will, when we move from this place as soon as possible, get involved with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to remain standing and the musicians to take their places as we begin and continue to worship in song. Uh, one other thing that I want to make note to you uh, about our new members, they all affirm our statement of faith, and so you should know that. And also, as I mentioned, Pastor Bob is a pastor. Well, Pastor Willie is also a pastor, and so we're welcoming two ordained ministers into our fellowship, which is another just, just great sign of God's grace to our church. So let's continue to worship in song. to 
having children's church today? When is that? Not yet. Okay. I saw the note in there. Pastor Jason has asked me to read a passage out of the Old Testament book of Micah. Micah chapter 5, the first four verses, and then to lead us in prayer. I'm reading out of the New American Standard, Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They have laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem of Paphrath, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Therefore, he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has borne a child. Then the remainder of his brethren will return to the sons of Israel, and he will arise and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will remain, because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. Pray with me. Lord God, your plan has been from the beginning of time to send a child, to be the savior of your people, to be the savior of the world, to be king. And through this child, the Messiah, your majesty, your power, shown throughout the world. Lord, we ask that you do it again. In these dark days, shine your light. Bring truth. Father, without you, we have no hope. We are a broken world, a dark world, surrounded by death, and destruction and despair. And yet on a hillside, one dark evening, angels sang, a star shone, and you entered again into our world. Do it again in our lives, in our time, for your glory, Father. And Lord, as we pray here, we lift up other fellowships around the area and believers. Lord, we lift up St. Stephen's just less than a mile down the road. Father, they just celebrated their 175th anniversary. Brother Mathis is leading them to come back from COVID and to worship together and to unify together. And Lord, Speaking to him the other day, they are dealing with some legal issues as they try to renovate uh, part of their building. And so, Lord, we lift up those issues and ask for your blessings upon them, that you would settle out those issues that they might finish their building. Thank you for their faithfulness in 175 years of showing compassion to their fellowship, to their flock, to their community. Thank you as they reach out with the gospel to those who need it. Lord, bless St. Stephen's and others, other fellowships around us. Lord, we lift up Mountain View Community Church and cars, reaching out to addicts in a Christian manner and drawing them to truth that they might live free of addictions as they follow you, the truth. 
Thank you, Father, for Pastor Mark's vision of, of cars. And Lord, you know there have been some uh, changing in direction, and they're now meeting in uh, about seven different locations uh, uh, monthly and weekly to uh, encourage those with addictions. Lord, we ask that you bless those times. We think about missions not only here and ministries not only here but around the world. And Father, uh, Persecution Project is located, the, the roots are located here in Culpeper, and we lift up uh, Ed Lyons and Brad Phillips who go to Sudan, one of the most dangerous places in the world today, where Christian villages are being bombed. And believers murdered. And they're going and digging wells to provide uh, clean water. They're delivering hundreds and hundreds of pounds of medical supplies. Father, we thank you for their providing active compassion, Christian concern, as they deliver Bibles and discipleship material to, to pastors and to churches in the Nuba Mountains of the Sudan. Father, they're going uh, soon this month to, on another uh, trip to take medical supplies and Bibles and Christian materials. And Lord, we ask that uh, you give them safe travels, that the materials that they're taking will get into the right hands, that the pastors will be encouraged as they go out into villages on motorcycles that have been provided uh, through Persecution Project and that your word will not come back void, that many will be encouraged to live in truth of the gospel. Father, closer to home, we, we lift up our government and our country, and Lord, I specifically pray this morning for Kamala Harris, our vice president, and Lord, to many, Sometimes even myself, she, she represents a, a, an evil empire, but Lord, you shed your blood for her as well as for me. And she represents our country, Father. And many look at the United States and say, that's a Christian nation. We know we're no longer a Christian nation, Father, but based on Christian principles. And so I ask, Father, that you bless our vice president and our president, that as they stand before the world, that they might speak truth. Lord, that you might enter, open their eyes to some of the things that they're saying and that you draw them, our leaders, closer to yourself. Not that they might agree with us on every issue, but Father, that they might represent truth and compassion to the needy and the oppressed. Give them wisdom to guide our country and in, man in like manner the world. Speak to their hearts as you speak to ours. Convict them of sin as you convict us. Open our eyes to truth as we pray for our leaders. Father, finally we lift up the offerings of this church and uh, the giving of your people. And we thank you, Father, for the way you've blessed us. Not so we can spend it on ourselves, but you're blessed that we might be a blessing to others. And so we give to support uh, this church and the pastor and the ministries of this church, but also to show compassionate action and love to others. Bless this time, Father, as we worship, as we come before you, the only true and living God. And may we not just sing with our lips, but worship from our hearts as you speak in your word and through prayer and through song. Bless our pastor 
as he prepares to come to speak to us your word for us this week. Bless this service, I pray now, in Christ's name, amen. Singers are going to come again and lead us in singing. If you'll please stand.
Thank you, musicians. That is our prayer this morning, that Christ would be magnified. Children, you are dismissed to Children's Church if you'd like to go. You're also welcome to stay, but there's also Children's Church this morning if you want to attend that. Um, I guess at this point, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17. And as many of you know, we've been working through the Gospel of John, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we've been doing that for many months now, and we, today we find ourselves in John chapter 17. I think you would be helped if you had a copy of God's Word in front of you. John chapter 17, if you do not have a Bible, you should be able to find one in the pew. Again, in front of you, that would be page 937 in the pew Bible. As you're turning there, I just want to remind you that this passage that we're going to study today comes within a broader section of the Gospel of John called the Farewell Discourse. It's at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, literally moments before his betrayal, moments before his crucifixion and death. And so Jesus is warning his disciples about the trials that they are going to face and the hatred that they're going to encounter, and the suffering that they will experience. But he's also encouraging them. As we saw last week, right, we saw that he was reminding them of the power of prayer and the presence of the Spirit and the peace that they can have in Christ, as we saw in John 16, These things I've spoken to you so that you may have peace. So that brings us to our text this morning. And at this point in the narrative, Jesus shifts from teaching his disciples, to praying for his disciples. And it is a magnificent prayer. Martin Luther would say of this prayer that it is so rich, so deep, so wide that none can fathom it. John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, had this prayer read to him every day leading up to his death. And he would testify that these verses gave him comfort and strength in his final days. The great Puritan pastor Anthony Burgess found this prayer to be so worthy of consideration that he preached no less than 145 sermons on this chapter alone. I mean, think about 145 sermons. If we were to do that, we would preach a sermon every week of every month of every year from now until April 13th, 2025. Okay? And so, you know, I, I'm, I see the worried look on your faces. You know, we're not going to be spending three years on this chapter. We will spend three weeks, but just know that even if we did spend three years on this text, we would still never be able to exhaust the depth of this passage. It is an extraordinary prayer. And I think one of the reasons why this prayer is so valuable for us is because the reality is if you really want to understand a man, you want to see what's in his heart, You want to truly understand his deepest and most intimate desires. Watch him pray. And I think that principle is important for us. It's instructive for us, right? I mean, if we just paid a little bit more attention to how we prayed, we'd probably learn a lot about our own hearts. But here, here is a window into the deepest thoughts and most fervent desires of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. One pastor described it as the stethoscope by which we can hear our Savior's heartbeat. Truly, these are sacred moments between God the Son and God the Father. And so with that context, let's read these first five verses. John chapter 17, hear now the word of God. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Heavenly Father, Lord, I come before you as your servant, 
And I feel completely unworthy to proclaim this message. I pray that you would receive all of the glory this morning. That I would be stepping out of the way and that you would speak through me. And that we would be awestruck once again by your majesty and your power and your authority and the glory of your son Jesus Christ this morning. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the late 19th century, a few American Christians were traveling to London on vacation. And their friends who were not going with them said, well, if you're going to London at this time, you have to go and hear the two great preachers in London, you know, Joseph Parker and Charles Spurgeon. Now, they didn't have internet at this time, right? They didn't have the benefit of podcasts or social media. So if, if you wanted to hear someone preach, I mean, you could read their sermons, but if you wanted to hear their preaching, you had to go in person. And so their friends said, look, if you're going to go to London, you've got to hear Joseph Parker and you've got to hear Charles Spurgeon. Then come back and tell us what it was like. And so they went, and as it came to pass, they were in London on a Sunday morning, and they were passing by the city temple where Joseph Parker was preaching that morning, and so they kind of crammed into this crowded auditorium, and they made their way, and they sat down, and they heard Joseph Parker preach. And very quickly, they realized that his reputation for eloquence and oratory was well-deserved. Finally, after they Heard him preach, they kind of stumbled out of the church in a bit of a daze. And it must be said, for there is no doubt that Joseph Parker is the greatest preacher that ever there was. In fact, they were so convinced of it that they decided they didn't even need to go to see Spurgeon preach. But they remembered the, the, the promise that they made to their friends. And so they made their way that evening to the London Tabernacle, which is where Spurgeon would preach. And they made their way in and they crowded into a, a crowded auditorium and they sat down and they listened to Spurgeon preach. And after the sermon, they kind of stumbled out of the church in a bit of a daze. And one of the men stood up and he said, I do declare, it must be said, for there is no doubt that Jesus Christ is the greatest Savior that ever there was. And that's my prayer for us this morning. That as we study this marvelous text, that Jesus Christ and his greatness would be on display, that we would be overwhelmed and overcome by the glory of Christ. Now, for the, those of you who are counting, my sermon this morning has six points, and so, you know, we're going to be on a bit of a journey this morning, typically. I mean, this is not a, a three points in a poem kind of sermon, and that's because this is not a three points in a poem kind of text, and so we're going to let the Word of God dictate how we work through this passage, and so we will have Six different points. We'll work through them one at a time. Having said that, I do endeavor to wrap it up before the sun sets, okay? So buckle your seatbelts. Here we go. Point number one, the hour of Christ. After speaking these last words to his disciples and pleading with them to take courage, Jesus lifts his eyes to heaven and he says, Father, the hour has come. Now, if you've been paying any attention to the Gospel of John, you remember that Jesus has been talking about this hour all throughout his ministry. We saw that in John chapter 2, right, when uh, the wedding feast in Cana, when the, they run out of wine and Jesus' mother comes up to him and he says, they, she says to him, do something, Jesus. Well, what does he say? He says, mother, what does this have to do with me? For my hour has not yet come. You see this again in John chapter 7, the feast of booths, and Jesus' brothers are kind of mocking him, they don't really believe that he's the Messiah. They're making fun of him, and they say, oh, if you truly are the Messiah, then just go up to Jerusalem. Well, everyone's there. Just go up to Jerusalem and show yourself to them. Reveal your majesty to them. And Jesus says, brothers, you go. I'm going to stay, for my hour has not yet come. See this in John chapter 8. Jesus is teaching in the temple, and the Pharisees are enraged, and they want to kill him. And we get this footnote at the end of John chapter 8, verse 20, that no one seized him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. But now, after years of preparation, of ministry, of healing, of calling people unto repent, 
now the hour has finally come and the culmination of Jesus' ministry has arrived. And this hour has a double edge to it because it's the hour of suffering, the hour of shame, the hour of the cross. But it's also the hour of victory, the hour of glory, and the hour of salvation. And Jesus uses the same language just a few verses back in chapter 16. Look at verse six, uh, chapter 16, verse 21. Jesus says this, Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. There it is, same language. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. A few years ago, on a beautiful Sunday morning, I got up and I was preparing to go to church and to worship and my wife at this time was very pregnant. And I looked over at her and I could see her wild eyes. And she took a deep breath. And I knew in that moment, the hour had come. Now, for those of you who've ever had the privilege of looking into the eyes of a woman in labor, you will see two things. The first thing that you will see is terror. I mean, absolute, sheer, unadulterated terror, right? Because once labor starts, there's no going back. I mean, this process has a conclusion, right? And so it's terror. But then if you look closely, and sometimes you have to look really closely, you will see resolve. A loving, sacrificial determination to suffer for the joy of a child. And here, Jesus is staring at the cross. And he sees the pain and the anguish that lies ahead. But as Hebrews 12 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame. For the joy. The same reason why my wife was able to get up that morning and make her way to the hospital. For the joy set before him. What was his joy? And this was a dreaded hour, but it was a joyful hour. Because Jesus knew that through it, he would redeem his people and he would be glorified. Which leads me to the second point, the request of Christ. In our text today, there's only really one prayer. There's one request that Jesus makes. Now, there's others that we'll see later on in, in John chapter 17. But here there's only one, and it is, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Glorify your son. That was his request. Now, for those of us who are human, it sounds a bit selfish, right? I mean, glorify me. But for Christ, this is not a selfish request. It's not a selfish request for two reasons. Number one, it's not selfish because Jesus understands what most of us don't. When we seek our glory, we do it at the expense of God's. But when Jesus speaks, seeks his glory, it's not at the expense of God's, but rather in order to glorify the Father. He says, Father, glorify me. Why? That the Son may glorify you. Listen, God the Father's splendor is on display when he brings about the death of his own Son for the salvation of unworthy sinners. It is glorious. God, glorify me that I may glorify you. And the other reason why it's not a selfish request is because Jesus is asking to be glorified and that is a, a glory that is due him. Right? He's asking for what is his by right. And he knew the Old Testament. He knew Isaiah 48 when it says, my glory I will not give to another. But here Jesus is asking for that glory because it is his by right. We read in Philippians 2, even though he existed in the form of God, he did not e regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But he, what did he do? He emptied himself. He became, took on the form of a bondservant and became like man. And he humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. And so here Jesus is asking to be glorified and he's asking for what is rightfully his. 
And when he took on flesh, he emptied himself. He didn't empty himself of his divine attributes. He was still divine, but he emptied himself of his glory. And now he's asking for his glory back. It's what is due him. He says, Father, you know the glory which I had with you before the foundation of the world. And you know that I have been obedient up until now and how I am surrendered to the cross. And now the darkest hour has come. But through it, I am redeeming your people. May you be glorified. Glorify me that I may glorify you. That is his request. As the author of Hebrews declares, he is the radiance, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. His hour, his request. Next, look at his authority, the authority of Christ. Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the glory that the Son may glorify you, verse 2, even as you have given him authority over all flesh. Listen, Jesus has authority. He's been given authority. The Greek word here for authority, exousia, means absolute dominion. Rule, power, reign. And notice how Jesus has been given authority over all flesh. But this is an astonishing statement. Right now on planet Earth, there are 7.95, roughly, billion people on the Earth. And they represent 11,995 unique people groups who speak over 7,000 different languages, who have over 4,000 different religions, and who live in 190 different nations. And every single one of them is under the power and reign of Jesus Christ. Amen? There is not, has never been, and will never be a single human being who is not under the dominion of Christ, including you, including me. And by the way, it doesn't stop there. Did you know that there are over 800,000 unique species of insects? By my count, that's roughly 800,000 too many. And yet he created and rules over every one of them. You know, that mosquito that ate me alive last night, he rules over him. That spider that haunts my dreams, he rules over him. There are 135 million insects on every acre of land. That is terrifying, okay? And if you multiply that by the 37 billion acres of land that cover planet Earth, that makes a number of insects that you can't even fathom, and yet he rules them. There are 200 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And it is just one galaxy of billions of galaxies. And he rules every one of them. Abraham Kuyper, the famous pastor, theologian, and prime minister of the Netherlands, said in his 1880 inaugural election address, there is not a square inch in this whole domain of our human existence over which Christ does not cry, Mine! Mine! You are His! And please understand, church, the only distinction between, is made between those who recognize His authority and submit to it and those who don't. But He rules nonetheless! The Bible makes it exceedingly clear that whenever we don't acknowledge and submit to his reign, we're acting like beasts. And we see this picture in Daniel chapter 4. The King Nebuchadnezzar, he's, he's really the ruler of the most powerful nation on planet earth at that time. And he's walking out of his royal palace on the roof of his palace. And he looks and he says these words, Is this not Babylon the Great? which I myself have built as a royal residence by my might and my power and my glory and my majesty. And immediately, while words were still in his mouth, he's cast down to the ground and begins eating the grass like a cow. And his nails grow like claws and his hair grows like feathers and he begins walking around on all fours like a beast of the field. And I think that picture... This is the king of all 
the known nations at this time, and he was the most powerful man on earth. And his very image would have been repulsive in the stench of his odor. And I think this is what we look like when we reject the reign of Christ. We look like animals. We're acting like beasts because everything that exists, everything that exists, exists for Christ. He has absolute authority. So the question is, are you every day waking up, every morning, surrendering your time, your talents, your energy, your money, your thought life, your entertainment, your hobbies, your passion, all of it, surrendering to Christ and to his reign? For he will have the glory. Or are you acting more like a beast of the fields? He has authority over all flesh. And this authority is purposeful. Look at the text. Look at verse 2. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, why does he have authority? That to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. It's the fourth point. The gift of Christ. His authority is purposeful. It has kind intentions. This is not an authority that wants to hold you down and oppress you. It's an authority that wants to free you. It's not an authority that destroys. It's an authority that builds. That does not take life. It gives life. Do not naturally go together. Life and eternal. All you have to do is look around you. And you'll see that everything that lives dies. This is not just true of humanity, but if you just look at the flowers or the trees or the birds or the animals, the fish, everything, if it has life, it eventually dies. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how smart you are, how powerful you are, how beautiful you are. Church. May we be overwhelmed this morning by this glorious truth. It's been said that the one who contemplates little of the hope to come will be shaped little by it. May we be shaped much by it. And this is eternal life. Verse 3, that they may know you, the only true God and the Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Listen. The glory of eternal life is not so much that it is life everlasting, but it is in knowing the everlasting one. We know this. Uh, Immortality without God, that's the definition of hell. But life, eternal life, knowing God, knowing Christ. The hour of Christ, the request of Christ, the authority of Christ, the gift of Christ. Very quickly, let's look at the work of Christ. Verse 4, I glorify you on the earth, listen, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Isn't that interesting? That Jesus speaks of his work on earth as having been already accomplished. And we know all throughout his ministry he was about his work. Even from very young age, right when he was 12 and his family, they go to Jerusalem and somehow they lose Jesus. Right? Wouldn't you like to have that on your conscience? You lost the Son of God. They lost him in Jerusalem for three days. They're looking for him. And what does he say when they find him? Didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? He was about his father's work. He was surrendered to him. He was so surrendered to the work of the cross that it was as good as complete. He uses the word teleosis in the Greek, which is the same root for the word that he uses on the cross, to telestai, it is finished. It is complete. No other sacrifice for sin is necessary. This is our confidence, Christian. You know, when Satan tempts you to despair, when I'm reminded of my wretched life, when I'm suffering here on earth, when my faith falters, where will I turn? Will I feel good about myself when I obtain worldly treasures, when I reflect on my own self-righteousness or feel good about my faith? No, I'll tell you where I'll turn. I'll turn to the completed work of Christ on the cross. It is finished. That's our confidence. What is it that we sing? 
I need no other sacrifice. Right? I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Very quickly, as we close the preeminence of Christ, verse 5. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You go back as far as you want, you have Christ. You will find Jesus. He is before all things. He's above all things. He's the beginning and the end. Paul says he is the firstborn from the dead. Why? So that he will have first place in everything. Have you ever heard the statement, you know, that, that's not my Jesus? Or, you know, I like to think of Jesus as this. Or I like to think of Jesus as that. And I've heard well-meaning Christians use that type of language. But can you imagine if I walked up to you and said, well, I like to think of you as a hippopotamus. Or I like to think of you as a polar bear or maybe a ballerina. Or you come to me and say, well, Jason, I like to think of you as a Redskin fan. Well, those are fighting words, okay? Those are not, because that's not true. And the point is that we do not have the right to define Christ however we want. As if we thought of Christ in the first place. I tell you this morning that the Jesus we worship did not begin with your thoughts. He began you. As one pastor put it, he is not just another priority. He is the page on which your priorities are written. So as I close this morning, we think about how do we apply this to our lives? You might be thinking, Pastor Jason, what's with this authority talk? Don't you know that the world doesn't like authority? You know, I don't want to be told what to do. Don't tell me that someone's over me. I have no authority other than myself. But the truth is that this simple confession of the church is Jesus is Lord. That's it. He's Lord. Revelation 7 says this, And I looked, and behold, a great multitude beyond number from every nation and tribe, every people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white and with palm branches in their hands, and they're crying out, Salvation belongs to the Lord who sits on His throne and to the Lamb. Will you worship Him? Listen, I do not live for myself. I do not live for my financial goals or for my children or for my grandchildren or for my reputation. I live for Christ. This is why we give as a church sacrificially to the Lottie Moon. And this is why we go to elementary schools in remote Kentucky. This is why we teach at the Junior Youth Club, or why we support missionaries like Brother Roy or, or Brother Chris Okuma, or why we support addiction recovery groups like CARS. Why do we do all this? Because there's a town called Stevensburg and a town called Culpeper, and we believe that here there are people who exist to glorify Christ. What did the prophet Micah say? He will be great. He will be great. Is he great in your heart? Is he great in your thoughts? Is he great in your life this morning? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning we are overcome with the greatness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that we would truly be in awe of his glory this morning. His prayer was that he would be glorified. Lord, may he be glorified in this church, in our hearts, in our lives. May we be about his glory. May we submit to his authority. May we recognize his preeminence. Father, we love you. 
we confess that far too often we do not live as though you rule in our lives. Forgive us. Challenge us this morning. Reveal the glory of Christ to us once more, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite the musicians to come forward now as we conclude with the song.